Okay, so um, it's Christine here. Um, coming back to talk with you about important connections between push out, zero tolerance, and school discipline. Um, so we've talked a bit about attendance policies and other types of, of school discipline um, that result from students not attending school um, because of truancy um, or quote dropping out. We're going to focus here specifically on push out um, and um, a lot of important content here. So let's dig in. Um, you know, I think one of the important quotes I want to think about here is from Ida B. Wells, who uh, who said the the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Right, and it's important for us to take a careful and critical look at the ways in which black girls are being pushed out of schools, um, in particular, um, and the ways in which um, these policies in schools, kind of where they started and how we got here and what we can do about them. And we can't do that without really focusing the light of truth. And you know that's really what Monique Morris does in Push Out. Um, she takes a really clear look at the ways in which discipline policies impact black girls in particular um, and the ways that black girls are criminalized. Um, you know, I think one of the things that often comes up when I have discussions with students about this in, um, in physical space classrooms, you know, is often that question of, you know, push out really articulates a lot of the problems and what about some of the solutions? And we'll talk about some of those solutions um, a little bit later in this lecture. Um, but as of this recording, um, the book Sing a Rhythm, Dance a Blues, um, also by Monique Morris, is forthcoming. Um, in just a few months in August of 2019 and you know this book really focuses on um, working with uh, educators who work successfully with girls of color um, and you know what things might look like in education if schools placed you know as it says here the flourishing of black and brown girls at their center and so um, if you haven't already taken a look at this book uh, when it comes out I want to encourage folks to to read it um, I think it's important for us to really think about what are viable solutions and what's working well as social workers and as educators um, this is essential work for us um, so I want to talk about <clears throat> the role of zero tolerance um, and discipline policies in schools that disproportionately impact youth of color, queer youth, and youth with disabilities. I want to talk a little bit about kind of how we got here um, in, in this country and some of the historical underpinnings of the policies that we find ourselves uh, faced with at this time. Um, Looking at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 26 says that education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. And I want to invite you to come back to this quote a little bit later after we think about um, the, the role of zero tolerance in schools and what messages that sends and how and whether that aligns with um, this declaration. So when we think about some of the kind of underpinnings of where zero tolerance came from, I think it's important for us to think back um, to the ways in which schools have been viewed as sites of resistance, um, as spaces where students make their voices heard, um, and at times where schools can be, you know, uh, used as forms of social control. Um, in fact, not unlike social workers can be used as, you know, agents of social control. I think that's important for us to think about, um, you know, education, um, like social work kind of um, values and services that we offer can both be used to support acts of liberation, but they can also be, uh, you know, uh, ways to to control people um, and you know we'll talk and go back even further into kind of more of the history of the United States um, education system and the numerous ways in which um, it has been used as a as a way to control um, and to dictate what is appropriate quote-unquote both language and culture and values um, and the ways in which you know that can really lend itself to um, particularly for communities of color to feel very unwelcome in public school settings. Um, we'll dig into that a lot more when we talk about parent engagement 
Um, but for now, I want to kind of go back a little bit to talking about some of those sites of resistance. Um, one, you know, powerful example um, are the students of Little Rock Nine. Right, so Brown versus Board of Education, Supreme Court decision to desegregate public schools. Um, that decision was rendered in 1954. Three years later, you know, um, we found that while the, the court decision had been rendered, right, public schools were not, in fact, desegregated. And as some of the reading you've already done, we can really look at, you know, Brown 60, 65 years later, we're still looking at the ways in which our schools are very much. Um, you know, de facto uh, remaining very segregated. Um, but in this particular example, um, you know, students uh, wanted to enroll and went to enroll in Little Rock Central High School, and they were prevented from enrolling by the governor. Um, and the governor sent out the Arkansas, the National Guard, and um, the National Guard originally, um, and you see the National Guard there depicted on the left, originally the National Guard was sent out to block the students from enrolling and entering the school. Um, but President Eisenhower um, actually federalized the National Guard and then turned them right around and it had them enforce the ability of the students to go into the school um, to register. Um, and so, you know, we have on the right-hand side the names of the Little Rock Nine, Ernest Green, Elizabeth Eckford, Jefferson Thomas, Terrence Roberts, Carlotta Walls, um, Mimi Jean Brown Tricky, Gloria J. Karl Mark, Thelma Mothershed, and Melba Patio Beals. Um, so the Little Rock Nine, right? So brave young people um, who took a stand to go in for their education um, while the whole nation was watching. And you see the ways in which literally there's a militarization of access to schools. Okay, and this is a powerful uh, moment. So I want us to really kind of look at, you know, their young faces on the right and, you know, look at look at what's happening there on the left, right? Um, so the military, you know, the ways in which the military is brought into the school. Um, you know, in the 1960s, or countless examples, um, summer of 68, um, some included the East LA walkouts. Uh, Chicano students, um, you know, felt there were, you know, really pointed out the ways in which um, there were widely, uh, wild, wide inequities in the uh, LAUSD, the Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, the mass protests uh, were happening throughout uh, Los Angeles. Um, at that time, they were pointing out statistics of one counselor to every 4,000 students. Uh, the students were really citing the fact that the curriculum and the material um, that was available to students um, did not reflect the students' realities, right? Um, we saw this mirrored further um, at San Francisco State on the left, um, also uh, 1968. Again, you see the military in full force. Um, <clears throat> At the campus, um, you know, the Third World Liberation Front rose up um, in protest of Eurocentric education. Um, there were a wide range of, of concerns raised during this time. Um, this is really the, the protest that gave rise to uh, the first ethnic studies program in the, in the country. Um, and um, so these were really um, another really powerful example that was widely uh, put into the news. Um, 1970, the May 4th massacre at Kent State. Um, you know, in Ohio, there were unarmed students who were protesting what was known as the Cambodian campaign at that time. Again, the National Guard was brought in, um, and 28 of them fired 67 rounds in 13 seconds into a crowd of unarmed students. So again, you know, again, we see guns, we see the militarization that's brought into the school setting. So, you know, I think this is important for us to think about in terms of, you know, what happens in spaces of resistance um, in schools um, from for many different points of view. Um, but I just think it's important for us to hold some of that backdrop. Additionally, I want to talk a little bit about some court and policy decisions um, that came forward that really kind of helped to shape um, and set up, if you will, a perfect storm for zero tolerance. 
Um, so at the top, you know, there, I want to just kind of point out the role of uh, court decisions um, and the role of juvenile rights. Uh, two Supreme Court decisions, U.S. Supreme Court decisions, you know, I talked in the first lecture about the power of case law. And um, in Ray Galt uh, decision in 1967, um, really looked at establishing um, a more formalized process for young people in the court system to be, um, to have rights. So prior to this decision, um, the, you know, uh, youth were, um, you know, the concerns of young people and, quote, the crimes of young people were addressed in the juvenile court system. And this was really viewed as quite an informal place um, where these matters were addressed. And in 1967, Inre Galt addressed the fact that young people also have the right to an attorney. They have a right to um, understand the charges being waged against them. They have a right to confront and cross-examine their accuser. Um, and so these rights, again, to an attorney, to charges, cross-examination, you can see, um, you know, on the plus side for folks who were really clamoring for additional rights for young people and not just, you know, kind of having them be passive victims of a system, but rather being kind of more active agents of their own, um, you know, defense, um, you know, in those ways, these changes could be quite warranted um, and, and viewed as helpful. On the negative side, and we can kind of more start to see this in hindsight um, more often, um, you can start to see the ways in which um, you, you hear very similar language to the kind of language that you hear in the criminal justice system. And this becomes important as we go forward. Um, the second decision listed there, Goss v. Lopez in 1975. Um, this was kind of... Um, you know, kind of going forward from the Galt, the Inre Galt decision, bringing it into the school realm. And so in Gauss v. Lopez, um, it established that public schools uh, need to ensure that students have a hearing before a student is suspended. Um, and so, you know, they have a right to understand, again, um, you know, the charges being waged against them. And without this hearing, um, it's actually a violation of their 14th Amendment due process uh, rights. And so, again, you know, both cases look at issues of due process. Um, so those are some things I want us to kind of keep in mind. And then we also have this kind of couch within larger notions of crime. And um, when we think about, for example, the war on drugs, you know, that really started um, under the Nixon administration, where drugs were, quote, public enemy number one. Um, so really looking at the ways in which uh, a focus on drugs per se was a concern. Then, you know, um, De Julio in the 1990s um, with kind of this assertion of the super predator um, that really, um, again, while he rescinded that um, in later years, um, you know, did an incredible amount of damage in terms of really focusing a lens on urban youth of color, teenagers um, who were repeatedly depicted in um, the news and in imagery as impulsive, violent gang members who were incapable of, en of any kind of empathy. Right? And so we have this really clear picture of these dangerous youth of color, um, you know, public enemy number one, the drugs. And against that, again, I'm not certainly saying it's a bad thing for young people to have their rights um, and the right to face their accusers, but we can kind of look at the scaffolding from In Ray Galt to start saying, yeah, we're going to make sure that young people have these same rights. It also can start to mean that we can start to look at young people more within the adult criminal justice system. And I think that's kind of more the, the place I want to kind of, um, you know, invite us to also hold on to that, that portion, right? And so, you know, just like any time we look at public policy change, it's important for us to think about both the um, desired change that could come from that, as well as the unintended consequences. Um, and I, I very much want to kind of uh, hold some of those unintended consequences, I think, that came from both of those decisions. Um, you know, then we, we kind of have some of these other examples of um, into the 1990s, you know, I shared some of those examples from the 60s when it started to be more acceptable for a militarized force to show up on campuses to kind of quell violence or kind of address civil 
quote, civil unrest, right? Um, and then into the 1990s, we've got this focus on drugs, we've got this focus on kind of tough on crime ideas. And so the federal uh, 1033 program, um, or the National Defense Authorization Act, is where Congress authorized a transfer of excess DOD or Department of Defense uh, property to federal and state agencies to use in counter drug activities. So this created the Federal 1033 program. Um, later, Congress passed the National Defense Authorization Act of 1997 that allow law enforcement agencies to acquire property uh, for bona fide law enforcement purposes to assist in their arrest and apprehension missions. And so this is important because you have the Department of Defense, which is really you know looking at matters of war and the ways in which you know that property is being kind of brought into and transferred into local law enforcement um, and you know being deemed as yep that's acceptable for us in terms of our counter drug activities so this becomes important for us to hold in our minds as we think about what's starting to happen in schools and in 1991, we have the National Association of School Resource Officers, NASRO. Um, this is founded and uh, developed the triad concept, um, kind of looking at uh, school police as teachers, informal counselors, and law enforcement officers in one. And, you know, um, there's a, a powerful documentary that if we had more time, um, I would want to show you. Um, it, if you do have a chance to uh, um, to rent it, I'll come back to that in a minute, but um, to, that kind of gets into the role of the SRO. Um, but some other federal legislation I want to touch on too are the, the Gun Free Schools Act of 1994. Um, Diane Feinstein uh, here in California and Byron Dorgan from uh, North Dakota, both Democrats um, were very strong in sponsoring the Gun Free Schools Act. Um, this, the, you know, uh, purpose was to eradicate eradicate guns from schools with zero tolerance for firearms and mandatory expulsion for offenders. So again, this is happening against the backdrop of this kind of these images of, this, of the uh, super predator um, and ironically, right, um, eradicating guns from schools at the very moment that um, law enforcement is starting to become increasingly militarized um, as a result of some of the policies I shared a moment ago. And the, you know, the NASRO and the National Association of School Resource Officers were starting to see resource officers in schools, right? That's really starting to come in the early 90s. Um, a part of the Gun Free Schools Act was mandatory expulsion for one year required by all schools who receive federal funds. Um, this is again for gun related um, offenses. Um, you know, again, there's some questions about the bearing of this on economic oppression um, in terms of, you know, what it means to expel a student for an entire year um, and the ways in which uh, schools may have been motivated by uh, their financial ties to, to federal funding in terms of implementing some of these policies. So by 1999, 94% of public schools in the United States had what were called zero tolerance policies. Um, and so, you know, again, you see this huge wave that comes from, um, you know, these changes in perception. And um, the funding through the Department of Justice for school resource officers through the COPS program really took hold um, and skyrocketed between 1999 and 2001. Um, so while NASRO was formed in 1991, um, you know, the funding uh, went up significantly again as more schools, um, nearly all schools, um, have these zero tolerance policies. So as I mentioned, um, a documentary earlier. It's called Zero Tolerance. Um, if I had time to share it with you, I would, but it's, I think it's about an hour. It's about 90 minutes or so. Um, you can rent it on, um, you know, online or at the local library if you're interested. Um, and it, ha it shows some powerful stories that really look at, uh, from several different perspectives, um, a largely, you know, um, critical lens, um, but certainly you hear uh, a critical lens of school resource officers in schools and the ways that they can be used. Um, but there is also a strong st stance from the, from NASRO about, um, you know, how it's important to put school resource officers who are trained as school resource officers in schools as opposed to kind of quote unquote regular straight up law enforcement. Um, so if you're interested, I encourage you to take a look at that. 
Um, you know, I think it's important, and as uh, Monique Morris reminds us, um, nationally, black and brown students are more likely to be arrested by school police, period. Um, and there's no evidence that students of color exhibit higher rates of misbehavior. Again, this is disproportionate, um, disproportionality um, in terms of looking at school arrests. Um, when we look at black and Latino youth in schools, um, when we look at black girls in particular during the 2015-16 school year, um, on the left-hand side, the school population, and on the right-hand side, um, in red, students are, uh, arrested or referred to law enforcement, right? So looking at the extreme disproportionality in black students more generally on the right-hand side, um, the school percentage of the school population, and then percentage of the gir of girls arrested at the school. Um, so, you know, it's important for us to kind of take a look at these uh, powerful statistics that really reveal um, disproportionality um, on the basis of race and the ways in which black girls in particular are singled out. Um, you know, this, um, Morris's book, of course, is, you know, um, a huge focus of your midterm. It is the focus of your midterm. Um, so you will have an opportunity to really dig in um, and explore um, you know, the meaning of this book and the meaning of the stories that are revealed there, I think is, um, for me, why this is the one book that I uh, require for this course is I think this is one of the most important books that we can read as social workers doing work in public schools. Um, and, um, you know, I think um, I look forward to hearing some of your reflections on that, um, on that book. I want to talk a little bit about something I've shared before, which is um, <clears throat> the importance, I think, for us as social workers to understand what the laws are um, and what the policies are so that we can make sure that our clients are well informed. And also when we look at, you know, what it means for us to engage in systems change, we have to be aware of, you know, the system itself. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what can be a little dry, but um, in terms of the sections of the education code. Uh, that relate to this. So there's some important things for us to understand relating to expulsions in California um, and as, as these relate to zero tolerance. So it's important to understand there's only five situations taking place at a school um, or at a school activity off school grounds in which administrators have no discretion, um, meaning that they can't um, decide anything other than to expel a student. Um, they must immediately suspend a student and recommend expulsion for a year. Um, that is for possessing, selling, or furnishing a firearm, brandishing a knife at another person, unlawfully selling a controlled substance. There's a little asterisk there, and I'll come back to that in a later slide. Uh, committing or attempting to commit a sexual assault or committing sexual battery and possession of an explosive. Okay, so these are what are considered zero tolerance offenses. Now, when we look at expulsions um, in the education code, these are uh, the kinds of examples, uh, the kinds of things where administrators have discretion as to whether or not to expel a student. They may expel a student for these things, um, but they may also issue a suspension. Okay, um, so. Um, you know, and I know that this is breaking all the PowerPoint rules, right? There's way too many words on here, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, there it is. Um, so inflicting physical injury, accept in self-defense, assault and battery, possession of a knife, possession or being under the influence of any controlled substance, um, except, and this is part of the asterisks I had earlier, uh, medication prescribed to the student by their doctor and the first offense of marijuana possession of less than an ounce. Okay, um, that reflects a recent change in the law. Robbery or extortion, property damage, smoking, cigarette possession, and paraphernalia. Sorry, it's paraphernalia. The A got lost there on the next slide. Um, disrupted school activities. And then you see their willful defiance. And it's crossed out. I have left it there because it's left its mark. Um, and um, I want to make sure that we come back and talk about willful defiance. Um, when we think about the power of uh, Monique Morris's work and that of other scholars who have really pointed out 
um, the powerful and very, very painful realities of push out and racial disproportionality in terms of discipline in public schools and the negative impact and pushing youth of color in particular um, through that school to prison pipeline, willful defiance was, you know, right at the top there in terms of um, how youth of color were targeted. And so it's important for us to understand that history um, and it still lives on in some of our current laws. So I'm going to come back to that. Um, some other um, administrative discretionary uh, categories of expulsion, including harassing, harassing, threatening, intimidating student witnesses in discipline hearings, engaging or attempting to engage in hazing or sexual harassment for grades 4 through 12, um, attempted uh, or caused hate violence, again, 4th through 12th grade. Um, what that means is that K through 3, uh, kindergarten through third grade, um, these are not um, these are not um, expulsion related offenses, um, and this becomes important as we look at some of the willful defiance laws too. Is that you, know, you see here uh, what we would call precedent in the law uh, to differentiate um, early earlier education or younger children from older children? Um, so we'll talk more about that. Um, other offenses are harassing, threatening, intimidating staff or pupils, um, or people's substantial disorder or creating a hostile environment, and terrorist threats. It's important to understand that all of these apply whether on school grounds, and then there are these other examples that sometimes people might not think of or realize. Um, they include going to or coming from school. Um, so, you know, getting, getting to school at the beginning of the day, leaving at the end, or leaving when a student leaves school. Um, during lunch, on or off campus. And there are some campuses, you know, where students are permitted off. You know, generally that's high schools. Um, and not all high schools, but, you know, sometimes that's, you know, that's completely a part of the school day. Other times students may... Um, take it upon themselves to have lunch off campus. Um, and it's important to understand that these things apply off-site as well. Um, also during or while going to or from a school-sponsored activity, that could be a sporting event, that could be a school dance off-site, it could be, you know, um, a, a field trip, um, that kind of thing. Um, um, outdoor education, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so this is the list, and again, you know where to look for it now that you know how to search um, in the Ed Code if you want to go and read it uh, more specifically, but um, it's pretty much all here on this slide. So um, there is a procedure, um, and, you know, again, we can kind of thank the court decisions um, from prior um, from prior years like Goss v. Lopez for in part having such such a procedure right so uh, the first step in an expulsion procedure is that the student needs to be recommended for expulsion by the principal they need to have a hearing within 10 days um, there need to be members of unbiased school staff on the panel School must have proof that the student engaged in the alleged activity. Students have a right to an attorney or an advocate and to question or challenge the decision. So again, you see this like, you know, there needs to be proof. There needs to be kind of a jury, if you will. Um, of course, they're all school staff, so, you know, we can talk about that. Um, and, you know, again, students have the right to an attorney or an advocate and to challenge the decision. So some um, wonderful resources. Um, where we've got social work folks on the teams um, in these agencies as well. These may be places that you have interned or you will be interning at or you may work at now or have worked at in the past. Um, I have their information on B courses, Legal Services for Children in San Francisco and the East Bay Community Law Center. Um, these are not the only two places, but these are two places that do, you know, the lion's share of this kind of work in the Bay. So, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of work around organizing to end willful defiance, and I think it's important to, you know, give a shout out to the Black Organizing Project um, and to other community groups, including, um, you know, and national groups as well, the NAACP, the ACLU, folks like Monique Morris, um, you know, have really helped um, to uh, point out 
um, the dangers of uh, using willful defiance as a means to deny students access to their education. Um, it's a very subjective term, and we'll get into that now. So um, current under current law, um, as of this recording, um, it, which is in 2019, um, in California, students in grades 4 through 12 can be suspended and in the past could have also been expelled if they disrupted school activities or otherwise willfully defied the valid authority of supervisors, teachers, administrators, school officials, or other school personnel engaged in the performance of their duties. So I want you to just sort of take in this uh, phrasing for a moment and think about what all you think might be included in disrupting school activities or otherwise willfully defying the valid authority. What is disrupted? Disrupted how? And what is willful? And what is defiance? Right? So is defiance anytime someone disagrees? Is defiance when, you know, uh, the person being defied or the person defining that they have been defied um, feels that, uh, you know, the student in this case was unjustified and not listening? Um, right? I mean, if we think about developmentally, um, you know, teenagers, for example, and challenging authority is something we know as social workers is, you know, part of a developmental process and individuation that happens even younger. Um, so, so, you know, whose behavior is viewed as defiance and whose behavior is viewed as cheeky or um, courageous or, um, you know, pushing the envelope, right? Um, again, how are these... Um, how are these assertions racialized? How are they, and how are they implemented, right? And so when the, the effects can be significant, you know, we really need to think about what it means to have really um, kind of generally worded policies. So, you know, you notice here it's for students in grades four through 12, and I mentioned earlier, there's now precedent in the, in the law in this state where we've really started looking at, um, if you will, what kinds of, of um, offenses, if you will, are age appropriate and what are not, okay? So it, I'm going to talk a little bit about what used to be and how we got here because these are some recent policy changes. Um, oh, and I also wanted to mention um, that as of this recording, um, these laws don't currently apply to charter schools, okay? So charter students in charter schools can still be suspended or expelled for willful defiance. Okay, so we're going to come back to that in a little bit. So when, when legal, this is a little historical, but not very long ago, um, when it was legal, this was the most often cited offense for expulsions from schools in California, period, dot even though it's a semicolon, but, <laughs> um, and so this is really important. This is a huge, um, you know, this isn't, you know, kind of a infrequently utilized, um, category, right? In 2012 to 13, it comprised of 43% of all suspensions in the state. Okay. So the most cited offense for expulsions, 43% of all suspensions statewide and nationally, um, there's been disparate application, um, you know, laws like willful defiance, it may have been called something slightly different in other states, but that same concept. Um, African American students are twice as likely to be suspended as white peers um, for willful defiance. Nationally, students of color are disproportionately referred for incidents of, quote, defiance, disobedience, disrespect, and black girls are referred at even higher rates. Now, some of the readings that I've asked you to do, um, both in, including push out, um, as well as some of our other readings, really look at the ways in which, um, you know, black children and black girls in particular are viewed as much more mature um, than their white peers. Um, and, you know, so, so at what point, you know, behavior starts to be viewed as willful defiance um, also can be diff very different, differently applied and, and clearly as we see statistically it has been. So some recent policy changes um, have really taken taken um, a very close and very critical look at willful defiance in the state of California. 
Um, Los Angeles Unified um, School Board was the first. Um, they voted to no longer use willful defiance as a reason to suspend or expel a student starting in 2013-14. So you can see that this is a local school district decision, right? We've talked about what the state law is. And as we talked about earlier, you know, schools are run at the local level, right? Um, and so, you know, of course they have to respect state law, but if they would like to, you know, make additional decisions within their district, they can do that. So um, what that means is that, you know, LAUSD no longer uses willful defiance at all. San Francisco Unified also voted to no longer use willful defiance. They um, brought that forward the following school year, 2014-15. Um, in 2014, AB 420 passed. So this was just a few years ago. So a few years ago, you could suspend and expel a student for willful defiance as young as kindergarten. Okay, and I just want to remind you that kindergarten is not even um, a compulsory year for education, and yet students can be suspended or expelled for willful defiance when you're five years old. Okay, so just want us to really hold that for a minute. Um, so AB 420 eliminated K3 suspensions and all expulsions for K12 for dis disruption and willful defiance. Um, under this bill, um, the way that it was written was that it needed to be reassessed in 2016 to become an op, um, or it would become an operative if no further legislation was passed by July 1st. And I share this little detail, and it's a little nerdy, but I want to just share with you, uh, for those of you who are interested in public policy work, that this is a really important example of a way where uh, people who are trying to facilitate, um, you know, substantive change um, like this, like removing willful defiance, when you think about how heavily it was utilized, um, you know, a lot of teachers were re reticent to let it go um, as kind of having that in their back pocket, as did, you know, administrators. And so, you know, when you have policymakers kind of looking at trying to make a change like this, and they really need the teachers on their side, right, to kind of agree to make these kinds of changes. And so what you'll see sometimes is that people will look for passing laws that have kind of what we call a sunset clause. And so the idea here was in, with AB 420 was that we're saying, okay, we're basically going to give this a try between, you know, if it passes in 2014 into 2015, we'll reassess it in 2016 and, you know, see how it's going. We'll take a look at the data. Do teachers feel and do administrators feel like it's drastically changed the landscape of public education such that they can't be safe or they can't teach children or, you know, whatever, you know, kind of people thought might be the worst case scenario. Um, but hey, if it's still working, you know, we'll pass another law. Um, if we find in 2016, you know, if after we reassess it and we find that, you know, it's not working, then this bill will sunset right, will sunset in 2018. Um, so that was an important thing, and you, you'll see this repeated um, multiple times as people do what I call kind of trying to chip away at willful defiance. Um, Oakland Unified uh, voted to no longer use willful defiance as a reason to suspend a student and invested in restorative justice in 2015. Um, it is important to understand that um, this came against a backdrop of significant criticism for disproportionate suspensions in that district. Um, in fact, they were investigated by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. Um, I did mention in an earlier lecture to look at, um, while that is an important arm of the federal government um, and the, gov the federal government's role in public education, you know, as we talked about, Betsy DeVos has really talked about the ways in which she is cutting back on resources to that office. Um, and has said, you know, in multiple settings that, for example, they're no longer going to look at uh, harassment um, and discrimination against um, gender nonconforming students, for example. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to understand that while that was a very important um, arm that was used under the Obama administration and prior administrations, um, in the current political climate, um, we may not be able to rely upon that office as much as one had in the past to kind of uh, take these kinds of stances. Um, that said, it did take such a stance. Um, 
and um, Oakland Unified, you know, heeded the call and said, okay, we've got to make some changes and we'll talk a little later in this lecture and you'll see some examples of what they're doing with that um, commitment. In 2018, um, you know, I mentioned this the sunsetting possibility that was going to happen with AB 420. Well, here came along AB 1808, um, which extended the prohibitions of AB 420 indefinitely. What, what in other words, um, the elimination of using willful defiance in K3 for suspensions or for any suspension, uh, ex excuse me, expulsions for K12 under willful defiance. That is still now the law. We no longer have this, and we're going to revisit it. Okay, um, it's basically on the books indefinitely. Um, and so that's a really important uh, change that recently occurred, happened last year. Um, and uh, AB 1360 extended um, the, extend the expulsion and suspension procedures to charter schools. Um, and so um, this is important to understand um, in terms of looking at um, the, the terms of AB 420 um, and you know what was enhanced through AB 1808. Um, so, so now these apply uh, to charter schools, so that's important. And with AB 1360, which also uh, passed in 2018 into law, um, this extended expulsion and suspension procedures, those that are outlined in the education code, to charter schools. Um, you know, including the attendant due process um, law, uh, due process clauses under the Constitution. So it's important to understand that. You know, there are elements of charter schools and the ways that the charters are written for those schools um, that have um, lied outside of um, education code uh, laws and things like when we think about um, Goss v. Lopez, you know, that was, you know, putting, putting into place the rights to a hearing uh, for a suspension and expulsion, uh, the right to understand the reasons why, the right to be informed. These things were not a part of charter schools per se, right? An individual charter school could have decided to do it, just like the LA uh, USD decided to stop using willful defiance um, before there was the formal change in the law, right? Um, but, but charter schools didn't have to do this until this law passed. And so, um, you know, there's also some ways in which, um, you know, future policy changes are looking to address this, um, which I'll talk about next. Um, so kind of what's next for willful defiance in California? Um, you know, uh, Nancy Skinner, who's pictured here at the one of the gates at Cal uh, with Cal students. Uh, Nancy Skinner represents uh, District 9 in Berkeley. Um, she uh, authored SB 607. Um, in the last legislative session here in the state where she attempted to expand the prohibitions of willful defiance um, and Governor Brown did uh, veto that. He was very hesitant um, about taking uh, taking more away from teachers. He said, hey, listen, we just passed AB 1808. Let's give it a chance to, to kind of see if we can um, uh, address it that way. Um, and uh, Nancy Skinner is bringing uh, AB 419 uh, forward now. Um, it's in the current uh, legislative session, um, and this is really to remove the use of willful defiance um, for uh, any any student, um, but again, um, maintaining some sort of a sunset, um, which I'll show you in a moment, um, and also extending the uh, ways in which we understand willful defiance and how it cannot be applied also to the to the charter school setting. Um, so I want to just show you um, how to look for uh, state bills and current legislation. Um, take this little opportunity to go back to our ledge info site. Um, so let's do that. Uh, we've gone there once before. You might remember when we were looking at 
um, when we were looking at the education code. So let's go back to the home page. And you can see, again, we have California law, right? That's where we were the last time we visited this website. Um, this time I want to go to bill information. Okay, so um, I was sharing with you, uh, talking about Nancy Skinner's uh, proposed legislation, SB 419. So the S just means Senate. It means it starts in the Senate. Um, and so uh, what we would say is the House, they want to know if it's the Assembly or the Senate, so we would say Senate. And the bill again is 419. And the session year is this year, okay? Um, there may, you know, um, I haven't really talked about this yet, but um, the way that bills are numbered, um, it simply starts with uh, number one is the first bill that's introduced that session year. So there's a Senate Bill 419 from, you know, past session years, right? Um, and so you can kind of see it goes all, this particular website goes all the way back to 1999. Um, so it's important to know the session year. If you, um, for example, when we talk about uh, foster youth, you may hear people talk about AB 12, right? Well, there's an Assembly Bill 12, um, was about extended foster care when it was passed. Um, but, you know, there's, there's other you know, AB 12s from different session years, right? So one might be about like mosquito abatement or something, right? <laughs> have nothing to do with foster youth. So if you find yourself looking up a bill and the text of it doesn't look anything like what you expected, it might be because you have the wrong session year. In any event, um, we do know that this is correct. So we're going to hit search. And you can see here the actual text of the bill introduced by Senator Skinner. Okay, so you can see that she introduced it on February 21st. Um, if you'd like to geek out with me and kind of watch what's happening with this bill, this is one I'm definitely watching. Um, so you can go to the status um, area and kind of look at, you know, where it's going. Um, so it's, you can see it's progressed through the Senate. It passed out of the Senate and now it's in committee in the assembly, right? So when a bill, um, for a bill to become a law, it starts in whichever house was the author. So in this case, it started in the Senate because it was a senator who authored it, Senator Skinner. Uh, when it passes out of the Senate, it goes to the next house, to the assembly. If it passes out of the assembly, it will go to the governor's desk where the governor can make one of three decisions. The governor can decide to sign it into law the governor can veto it, or they can let it sit um, for a brief period, and then it will become law by default. Um, and so um, we're seeing the bill go through the assembly currently, um, and we can see that the last thing that happened was uh, just, um, it's currently May 16th, um, so this was just, you know, 10 days ago, it was referred to the Committee on Education. That makes sense, because this bill focuses on education. Um, if you are interested in um, kind of keeping track of this bill, you can track it and you can get email updates. Um, little nerd alert on that. <laughs> so um, if you're interested in um, looking at a bill analysis, um, this is where you can see um, how it was analyzed by folks um, who kind of took a look at it when it was on the Senate floor. Um, it kind of breaks down the bill into kind of sometimes more easily understood language. Um, it also uh, kind of goes into uh, areas of comments. So you'll see like things the author said, um, areas, um, kind of some background information, that there's some discretion involved, that suspensions are declining in school districts, that public uh, people engagement is a state priority. This refers to the local control funding formula and LCAP, um, equity uh, concerns and subjective discipline. This talks about racial disproportionality and also uh, with queer students, um, how it's related to past legislation. So and then this bottom section is support. Um, these are verified folks who support the bill. Um, this can help give you a sense, um, you know, kind of who's in support of uh, Senator Skinner's law uh, bill. Uh, we see our colleagues at the East Bay Community Law Center. I mentioned them earlier um, as, um, you know, being very involved in this area. Um, you know, we see lots of different groups, including the California State uh, Parent Teacher Association, um, 
you know, so who's on here? Good to notice that. Okay, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can look there. You might find some of this helpful for your midterm. Just saying, you don't have to, but you might. Um, and um, if you want to look at the actual text of the law, you look, you click on text, and then you can read it here. Okay. So this is how the law, um, the bill is written into the law. You can see where it strikes things out, um, kind of shows changes and amendments that have happened. Um, and so I think some of the important things for us to, to note here um, and the primary focus of this particular bill um, is to differentiate it from existing law. Okay, so again, existing law prohibits a pupil from being suspended from school or recommend for expulsion unless the superintendent of the school district or the principal um, determines they've committed a specific act, right? We talked about those acts, uh, disrupting school activities, or otherwise willfully defying the valid authority of supervisors, teachers, administrators, school officials. Existing law prohibits the suspension um, of a pupil enrolled in kindergarten or any grades one through three inclusive for expulsion for willful defiance, right? So it's currently prohibited for being suspended for these reasons or expelled for K through three. This bill, and this is what this one would do, this bill would apply to those provisions to charter schools. This bill, the bill would additionally prohibit the suspension of a pupil enrolled in school district or charter school in any of grades four through eight inclusive for disrupting school activities or otherwise willfully defying the valid authority of those school personnel engaged in the performance of their duties. Okay, so this basically increases um, the, pro the prohibitions of use of willful defiance uh, for suspensions all the way up from you know, now you can't do it K through three, this would bring it up to eighth grade. And the bill until January 1st, 2025, would prohibit the suspension of a pupil enrolled in a school district or charter school in any of grades nine through 12 inclusive for those acts. Okay, so again, you see this sunset idea, right? Where they're saying, okay, we're gonna extend this. This is what we want. We wanna extend this into the realm of charter schools, period, um, and, we want to ensure that willful defiance cannot be used, period, dot, K through eight, so all the way through middle school. Where they're leaving the door open um, for this sunset is through high school, right? So grades nine through 12, um, when people think about uh, students, quote, talking back or being disrespectful, um, you know, those kinds of, that kind of language, um, you know, one might be apt to think of an older teenager. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely been a lot of resistance in the high schools um, to eliminating willful defiance. And so this is Nancy Skinner's way of saying, okay, we're just going to try it because we have precedent of this happening and this helping, right? So we had, as we talked about in the slides a little bit ago, um, you know, this precedent um, that we discussed that willful defiance was eliminated for suspensions and all expulsions in 2014. And they said, hey, we'll reassess in 2016 and it's gonna sunset unless we reestablish something in 2018. And since there wasn't a huge clamoring to say, oh my gosh, schools are falling apart without this option of willful defiance, you know, it made it easier to pass AB 1808 in 2018 to extend those prohibitions that were listed in AB 420 indefinitely. So this is, um, you know, an important example of how policy works, and this is a very current example of some changes that really have a huge part to play in the school-to-prison pipeline. Willful defiance is one of the most, um, you know, uh, often cited, as I've said before, um, reasons to expel or suspend uh, youth, and particularly youth of color, um, and black girls in particular. So let's stay tuned for that. Um, so coming back to the law, uh, we talked about expulsions. Now I want to talk about briefly suspensions. So suspensions cannot be for more than five consecutive school days unless the student is being expelled. Um, suspensions could be longer, though, 
If following the meeting with the student and the parents, that student's presence at the school pending the expulsion hearing causes danger or threat to the person, property, or instructional process, you cannot suspend a student for tardies or truancy. Um, it's good to say that explicitly. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense that you would suspend a student for not coming to school because they, if they're suspended, they're not going to school. Uh, suspensions should only be used when other means fail. And for dangerous or public health offenses, um, a student can be suspended on their first offense. Um, suspension procedures are also defined. Um, it involves removal of a student from ongoing instruction for adjustment purposes. This does not include reassignment to another class or removal for the remainder of the period. This first point is really important. I think, you know, if you have worked in schools, you may have seen this yourself um, or talked to colleagues who have seen it happen. Um, certainly looking at um, suspensions and expulsions, particularly with students of color, is something that has come under large levels of scrutiny. Um, you know, and when we think about the local control funding formula and we look at some of these other grant programs um, that I mentioned in prior lectures, um, you know, for students who are really looking to tackle issues of, of truancy and to tackle issues of racial disproportionality in terms of discipline, um, you know, schools will sometimes get creative. And so we'll say like, yeah, well, the student's not really suspended. They're just, um, we're just sending them to room five and maybe their usual classroom is room 10, right? Um, so it doesn't count as a suspension if they're just kind of put in another class um, or removed for the remainder of that class period. Um, so I think it's important for us as social workers to pay attention both to the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Um, so if the letter of the law, they're not being suspended, that's one thing. Um, but we may need to sometimes raise questions about um, how students are being treated if we find that students are repeatedly being sent to another classroom and therefore missing exceptional amounts of, of uh, classroom instruction because they're not in their regular classroom. Um, Back to the actual ed code, a teacher, principal, or superintendent may suspend a student for any reason. Um, uh, for any reason, a student can be suspended. So that's important, right? That's a pretty broad brush. Um, although a teacher can only suspend a student for any reason for two days. Um, so that's an important, um, important thing to keep in mind. So, suspension procedures, um, again, students have a right to know what those procedures are. If these are not followed, um, it is a legal issue, and students can, you know, retain legal counsel, like I mentioned, um, some of those resources like Legal Services for Children or East Bay Community Law Center to help them with their rights. So suspensions should be preceded by an informal conference with the principal, where one, students informed of the reason and given an opportunity to give their, ver their version of events and their defense, um, why they should not be suspended. Um, it can be done without a conference if it's in an emergency situation as defined in the Education Code. If it's without a conference, both the parent and the student should be notified of the student's right to a conference held within two school days unless they waive the right or physically or they are unable to attend. The school must make reasonable efforts to contact the parent by phone or in person. Whenever a student is suspended, the parent shall be notified in writing of the suspension. In the law, it's important to understand the difference between words like may and shall. Shall means you must do it. There is no option. Um, you're breaking the law if you fail to do it. Okay, May means you can do it. You won't get in trouble if you do it, but you won't get in trouble if you don't do it. So here it's very clear the law says it, uh, the school shall. So parents need to be notified in writing whenever their student is suspended, period. So, you know, when we think about some of these policies, we have some really important policy choice points, right? When we think about the fact that 1.6 million students attend a school with a school police officer but not a school counselor. That's, those are some pretty powerful statistics to consider. Right? When we think about the fact that students of color are more likely to attend schools that employ school police officers and not school counselors, and then on top of that, that black students are three times more likely to attend schools with more security staff than mental health personnel, we know that we have you know, a serious problem where when we think about the reason why you're taking this class, um, is probably because you have to <laughs> for your PPSC. And so, you know, what are you going to do with that, with those letters, right? Like, what what is our role in schools? Um, 
Well, not all of you will use your PPSC to be a, a mental health personnel in a school. Um, as, as school social workers, we're often making sure that mental health personnel are coming in if we are not also part of that. Um, but we're certainly often viewed as counselors in those situations. And we do you know, have a really important role to play in, in mitigating the police presence in schools. Um, you know, I um, want to say that I thought about sharing the video clip for this. Um, it can be very triggering for folks um, if you do not remember this particular example, assault at Spring Valley, and there's a whole, uh, you know, Twitter piece around, you know, hashtag assault at um, for tracking all of the students of color, particularly black students who are being assaulted in public schools. Um, and so we want to really um, honor that and, and recognize the significant numbers of students who are being assaulted by showing up to school. Um, this particular example was shown repeatedly on social media uh, back in 2015. You may remember the 16-year-old black girl seated in a classroom. She was assaulted by the school resource officer who threw her across the room. Um, you know, there was some discussion that she didn't put her cell phone away. Uh, we later learned that this young woman was a foster youth. She had recently lost her mother. She would recently died um, and was going through a lot. Um, and, um, you know, saw those images repeatedly of her being thrown across the classroom while she was seated in her chair. Um, you know, these are really powerful stories and, um, you know, hers is just one of many. Um, and when we think about, again, it's part of why I really want us to read Push Out for this class and really have that at the heart and the center of, of a lot of what we're talking about this semester or this summer. This particular officer was fired two days after the incident by the police department. It was later investigated by the FBI, um, and the findings were issued a year later, um, and they found no conclusive evidence that civil rights were violated. The a year in 2017, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division found, quote, insufficient evidence to pursue a criminal civil rights charges against this former school resource officer. Um, you know, and again, if you um, haven't seen it, you know, it's easy. Uh, you can certainly Google Assault at Spring Valley. I will put a link on the um, resource page. I just want to be respectful. I know for some of us, it's very triggering to watch that again um, and again. And also, it's important if you haven't seen it, it's important to um, you know, recognize what's happening um, to our students in schools. Um, and so, um, again, you have another example where you know, it was caught on videotape and um, in you, and yet this is how the systems responded, uh, though he did lose his, his job. There were no criminal uh, charges filed, or yeah, he wasn't held accountable, excuse me. Um, so we came to learn is one of the resources that I put on B courses that I asked you to take a look at uh, when we think about you know what it means for us to mobilize for change. Um, you know, I think there's an important call to action for divestment from law enforcement strategies in schools. You know as we've talked about in this lecture, there's a long history of um, law enforcement presence and a militariz uh, militarized presence in schools. Um, to really deprioritize a reliance on school police, disarming school personnel, including police. Um, you know, this runs uh, contrary to some of the things that Betsy DeVos has certainly talked about in terms of, you know, and also the Trump administration has, you know, posited this notion of teachers, uh, armed teachers in schools. Um, Mobilizing for change also looks at decriminalizing student behavior, delegitimizing policing as a safety mechanism, and dismantling school policing. So there's a real call to action around, um, you know, a removal of, of school police in school settings. And a quote from Dominga Black, um, age 18, um, she says, we need to expand the definition of an investment in public safety to include more school-based counselors, social workers, and nurses. Counselors, social workers, and nurses are trained to de-escalate community members in distress, whereas law enforcement are trained to meet force with force and to neutralize potential threats. Too often, youth of color and young people from low-income communities are seen as this threat by law enforcement. All students have the right to safety and security, and for many, that does not include police and armed personnel. Safety for all includes restorative practices and restorative justice, not zero tolerance or criminalization practices that re-traumatize youth of color and young people from low-income communities. Um, and I think um, she said it best. I don't need to 
add anything to that. So when we talk about some of these viable alternatives, and you know, I know this lecture is getting a bit long, um, and um, you know, it's it's obviously fine to take a break and come back to some of this, but I do want to talk about what are vi viable alternatives and restorative practice or RP or RJ, um, you know, are an important part of that story. So, um, in 2013, AB 1729. Um, passed and it requires alternative strategies before suspension for nonviolent infractions. Um, and RJ is specifically included as one of those alternative strategies in the law. Um, so it's important for us and behooves us as social workers to really understand this piece. Um, you know, and if you're getting your PPSC, you've also had to take or you will be taking um, you know, a school's practice class, and, you know, you'll certainly talk more about um, how to do restorative practices and kind of the practical hands-on of the doing of it, if you will, um, in that class. And here, I just want to focus, you know, make sure that we've talked about it because it also is an important policy uh, initiative. Restorative practice in schools, you know, kind of, again, if you're not as familiar with it, certainly, you know, call, um, calls from and has its uh, roots and origins in indigenous cultures and practices, um, and really looking at bringing the community together, um, and really looking at, you know, um, you know, what harm was caused and, and what can be done to, to make it right. Um, it is one of the top interventions recommended by the Department of Education, Department of Justice, and NAACP, uh, Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, to really look at mitigating the negative impact of, of zero tolerance and law enforcement presence in schools and also exclusionary discipline. So, you know, RP is really an important part of our toolbox in social work practice. You know, other recommendations that are often used in conjunction with RP are PBIS and RTI. Um, which we've talked about in a prior lecture. I talked about this um, more in the special education lecture um, about kind of what those things are about, right, and, and how uh, RP is related to um, response to intervention and positive behavioral systems. So RP um, foundational principles, you know, really kind of at the bottom line is people are happier and more cooperative when you do with versus doing two or four people, right, or others. Um, you know, that it's at its foundation um, is a lot about community building and relationship building. But we need to restore relationships when harm has occurred over and above the need to assign blame or punish, right? So making it right versus being right. Um, you know, and when I say being right, I mean like the system, like, you know, to sometimes I think systems and individuals within those systems can get really focused on needing young people to see that, you know, the rule was broken and that I was right. I, as the rule holder, was right and they were wrong. Um, and that that really overshadows the idea of like making the situation right, right, and doing right by the person who was harmed. So important values for restorative practices, including uh, building community relationships. We talked about the with versus two or four. Um, looking at the notion of equity versus equality, which is something we've talked about in prior uh, lectures, right? You remember that image, um, the kind of the difference between equality versus equity, right? All having the same uh, same size box to stand on to look over the fence um, versus equity is everyone having a proportionate size box and then, you know, liberation is no fence, right? <laughs> you might remember that. Um, RP looks at mistakes um, as opportunities for learning instead of, you know, things to, to punish. Um, really look at people's strengths and collaboration, um, areas of responsibility, trauma-informed. Looking at um, honoring the voice of the person who was harmed um, and recognizing that all people are valued members of the community looking at root causes versus the symptom, right? So not just that somebody hit, but like why the person hit, what triggered them, what happened before that. Um, you know, what are the unmet needs? What are the unsolved problems? How to stand in someone else's shoes and hold empathy? Um, you know, and at its base, of course, right? Being restorative versus punitive, right? So these are some important um, things for us to kind of um, go back and, and, and do things differently, right? Instead of kind of having the school system mirror the criminal justice system. Again, while the intentions may have been good for young people to be able to face their accusers and not just be able to be expelled or suspended, um, and while it's important for young people to have representation in court, 
when we think about um, you know, schools really being those sites and, and not being sites of learning, but being more sites of punishment and zero tolerance and, and police, it becomes, you know, we're not as focused on education and it's not restorative, right? So what do we do instead? RP is a huge, a huge piece for us. Um, the ultimate goal in schools is to lower rates of suspension and expulsion and foster positive school climate. Um, with the ultimate goal of eliminating racially disproportionate discipline practices and the resulting push out of students into the prison pipeline. Um, so, you know, we think about what it means for us to push back against school push out, you know, RJ, RP, these are huge, again, parts of that work. Um, when we think about RP's responses to wrongdoing, you know, again, I've kind of talked about this already, right? It'll kind of like focus on the laws versus the focus on harm and, and how to how to restore relationships. Um, and I have the slides of these PDF, uh, PDF of the slides available for you if you want to refer to them there later. Um, and one of the things I asked you to watch for this week was the example of um, restorative practices in Oakland Unified, um, that eight minute video. If you haven't looked at it, um, I do want to make sure that you um, stop this and head over there and, and watch it and come back um, because I think it's important to get a picture of what we're talking about with RJ because it can sound just very theoretical if you kind of, you know, don't having the stories of young people and the adults who are a part of supporting that in the schools um, are important voices for us to hear. And we have some of our colleagues at McClyman's in uh, Oakland talking about their work in RJ. Um, and here are some important reminders about restorative conversations and harm circles. Um, so again, you can kind of refer back to this when you look at the slides at a later time, assuming that you do that, which you might not, but I hope you do. And, you know, just remember, um, it's important for us to remember kind of where we started this lecture, which really is thinking about push out. And um, it's important for us to make sure that um, our policies reflect the, the fact that black girls matter. Um, we need to keep it up. We need to stay accountable um, to all students. Um, and, you know, when we think about the ways in which black girls in particular um, at much higher rates are highly disproportionately impacted um, by these school discipline policies. Uh, we need to make it right. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing more about your thoughts on these topics, both in our discussions, <coughs> excuse me, and also in your push-out essays. Thanks so much.